second hour today, we want to uh, talk about some definitions of terms. Um, I defined logic for you during the first hour as the science of necessary inference. But we need to talk about some definitions of other terms. Whenever you're learning a new discipline, I don't care what it is, whether it's geography or botany or chemistry or geometry, you have to learn the language of the discipline. The first time you hear the terms, of course, they're unfamiliar to you. But if you read the material or listen to the tapes uh, the second time or the third time, rehearse the definitions in your mind, then you'll become familiar with them and they will not appear nearly so intimidating as they might at first. There's nothing peculiar about logic in that sense. Uh, it's just that we emphasize teaching you the definitions up front, particularly in a course as short as this, uh, so that you don't get completely lost. Well, logic is the science of necessary inference. Uh, Clark begins the text by talking about the word argument. What does the word argument mean? And he distinguishes it from altercation. In logic, when we talk about arguments, we're not talking about conversations in which people raise their voices and uh, begin a verbal battle with each other. We're not talking about that sort of thing at all. An argument is a connected series of statements or reasons intended to establish a position or a conclusion. An argument is a connected series of statements. The simple example I gave in the first hour about David and Absalom is an argument. David is king of Israel. Absalom is the son of David. Therefore, Absalom is the son of the king of Israel. It's a connected series of reasons or statements given to establish a position or a conclusion. Now, I mentioned in also the first hour the distinction between a sentence and a proposition. Uh, sentences come in various moods. There are some in the declarative mood, such as David was king of Israel, some in the imperative mood, thou shalt not kill, some in the interrogative mood, was David a king of Israel, and some are exclamations. They come in various moods. A proposition is the meaning of a declarative sentence. It's the meaning of a declarative sentence. It's not the sentence itself. In English, we say it's raining. In French, we say il pleut. In German, we say es regnet. Three sentences, three different language, one proposition. It's raining. The meaning of the declarative sentence. So don't confuse sentences and propositions. Even in English, uh, sometimes sentences appear in the active voice or the passive voice, and they can be expressed by one proposition, even though the sentences are quite different. The voices don't make any difference. The languages don't make any difference. The actual words do not make a difference. Uh, it doesn't make any difference whether you call a domesticated canine, a dog, a hund, as they do in Germany, or a chien, as they do in French. Uh, this, this particular sound makes no difference in logic. It's the meaning of the declarative sense. We should also define the word term. Term. Term is not exactly a word. When we get to study... Uh, categorical forms uh, a couple of days from now, we'll see that there are two terms in a proposition, the subject and the predicate. There are two terms. 
a subject and a predicate. A logical term uh, may or may not be the equivalent of a single word. More likely than not, uh, it isn't. In the example I gave you on necessary inference, whether you take the Socrates example or the Absalom example, each of those arguments, uh, let me see if I can find them and put them up there for you again, each of those arguments has two premises and one conclusion. By premise, we mean a reason given, and a conclusion is the inference or the proposition derived from the premises, the proposition derived from the reasons. The first two, it just so happens, this is not always the case. Don't be deceived here. In fact, in ordinary language and in the Bible, uh, we most often find the conclusion stated first and then the reasons given. But to make things clearer here, uh, we list the reasons or the premises first and the conclusions stated last. But that's not always the case. And it really makes no difference which order you list them in. Logic is not time. Logic has nothing to do with chronology. You can list the conclusion first, if you wish, in an argument, and the premises or the reasons later, it makes no difference. The argument, at least these two, are still valid, or is still valid. Has anyone had geometry? Has anyone studied geometry? Ah, very good. Can anyone tell me what an axiom is? It's a statement. Any particular kind of statement? <laughs> yes, sir. A true statement? Not necessarily. I'm sorry? I didn't catch that. Okay, it's a statement that's part of your proof. What's the distinction between an axiom and a theorem? A theorem is also a statement. It's also part of your proof. I'm sorry? The theorem is the axiom of the proof. The theorem is the theorem of the Okay, uh, the theorem is a conclusion. The axiom is your starting point or your premise. In fact, it's a, it's a peculiar kind of premise, and that is a first principle or a first premise. It's unproven by definition. Uh, axioms are indispensable, not just for geometry, but for all thought. If you are thinking, you had to start thinking somewhere. And wherever you started that thinking was your axiom. Whichever proposition is most fundamental in your thinking, that is your starting point. That is your axiom. It's not proven. It can't be proven. Why can't it be proven? Why can't you prove an axiom? It's your basis. Okay? It's the basis for all proof. Obviously, if an axiom is your first principle, your starting point, your most basic premise, there's nothing before it. It's first. That's the meaning of first. It cannot be proven. No, not first cause. It cannot be proven. What is the axiom of Christianity? Which God? I'm sorry? How do you know that? How do you know his name? The Bible. So the existence of God isn't your first principle. The Bible is. It's prior to that. That's the only reason you know of God. The axiom of Christianity is the Bible alone is the word of God. That's the starting point. It's unproven. It's unprovable. Yes, sir. Well, that's true, but you wouldn't know it. <laughs> I'm sorry? Right. Right. And it's, and it's the Bible. Uh, if people pay, uh, say God is first... The question is, which God? 
Many different kinds of gods have been proposed, and the only way you can define that little word G-O-D is by looking at Scripture. That's the only way you can define it properly. Yes, sir. How does that follow? That's true. How do you know that? How do you know that? <laughs> That's right. All of which is true, and all of which we know based on the Bible. Yes, for our sake. Yes, sir, in the back. Well, he's, he's saying Christianity is based on the existence of God. That's the, that's the axiom. That's his assertion. That's the axiom. And my claim is it's not the axiom. Because the word G-O-D is meaningless until we define it, and if we're going to define it properly and truly, we have to read the Bible. We have to start with the Bible. The existence of God is not the axiom of Christianity. But anyway, a, an axiom is a first principle, it's unproven, it's unprovable. Uh, many theologians have wasted enormous amounts of time and energy trying to prove the Bible is the word of God. Uh, it cannot be done. Uh, many theologians have wasted an enormous amount of time and energy trying to prove God exists, for that matter, and it cannot be done. A theorem, now the axiom functions in the form of a first premise. A theorem is something deduced from the axiom or another theorem, if you have an extended argument. But a theorem is proven. It is provable or disprovable. It is not a first principle at all. And in geometry, uh, you learn very early uh, the difference between axioms and theorems. When Euclid, uh, another pagan Greek uh, philosopher, uh, began his study of geometry. He started out with a few theorem, a few axioms. I've forgotten whether there were five or six. It's been a long time since I had geometry as well as you folks. Um, and he deduced hundreds of theorems from them. Starting out with just a few axioms. Deduced hundreds of theorems from them. And it's amazing, I hope later this week to give you some illustrations of how much information is actually embedded in just a few propositions. Uh, and we'll, I'll try to illustrate that for you. But in, in Euclid's case, uh, starting out with half a dozen axioms, he comes up with hundreds of theorems. Now, if we look at the Bible, for example, and we assume the Bible is our axiom, the Bible is the word of God, uh, it contains, I don't know, 5, 10, 15,000 propositions. And when you think of the number of possible implications to be derived from that body of propositions, uh, you're talking about an enormous amount of knowledge all of which is true because all of which is given uh, by revelation from God. Uh, many people seem to think that uh, Christianity uh, claims to know only a little bit, but that's only because 
the work in deriving information from the propositions in the Bible has only begun um, after 2,000 years after Christ. We talk in theology about uh, propositional revelation. And propositional revelation has to do with propositions. When we talk about the inspiration of Scripture, we're talking about two kinds, verbal and plenary. All of Scripture is inspired. All of Scripture is given by God. And every word in Scripture uh, is given by God. And those words and sentences express the, the uh, uh, or embody the propositions of the revelation. There is another word in the first chapter that Clark uses that we need to talk briefly about, and that's enthymeme. Enthymeme. E-N-T-H-Y-M-E-M-E. -E. Enthymeme. It means an argument, remember, recall what an argument is, in which one of the premises is omitted or understood. And he gives the illustration of a youngster uh, persuading his parents to let him go buy some gloves. And he doesn't express the full argument. Uh, most of our conversations in ordinary life are infamy. Some of the uh, premises are not stated, they're understood. Uh, it would be very burdensome, very tedious, if every time we wanted to talk to someone to repeat all the premises and ask him to agree to the conclusion. Uh, so we operate on the basis that some things are understood. It's an ellipsis, as it were, in the argument. Some people have charged the Bible with committing logical fallacies. And what they ordinarily have in mind are enthymemes. Uh, perhaps they've run across an argument in Paul's letters uh, where he leaves out a premise as being understood. And they say, look, the Bible can't be the word of God. Here's a logical fallacy. And all Paul has done is written down an enthymeme. The Bible is written in ordinary language. It's not written as a logic textbook or a botany textbook, or a geology textbook. It's written in ordinary language. And in ordinary language, ordinary conversation, usually the complete argument is not stated. Sometimes it is. Uh, in one of the lectures, I'll talk about Paul's use of logic. And particularly in Romans and 1 Corinthians, he states the full argument. On several occasions, no enthymemes. But you need to be aware of the existence of enthymemes uh, when people say the Bible has logical blunders in it. Then you can say, well, perhaps it's just an enthymeme uh, that perhaps you've overlooked. <laughs> that will drive them to their dictionary. There's another word that Clark talks about. It's sorites. Sorites. S-O-R-I-T-E-S. Sorites. And a sorites is an extended argument in which the conclusion of the first argument becomes the premise of the next. The conclusion of the first argument becomes the premise of the next. And perhaps if it goes on for longer than that, the conclusion of the second argument becomes the premise of the next. Yes, sir? No. Premise does not have to be an axiom. A premise can be a theorem derived from a prior argument. At one point, and I don't recall the reference, it's in the Gospel of John, Christ says, <clears throat> All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and all that come to me I will in no wise cast out. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and all that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. That's a statement from Christ. He does not make the conclusion 
He does not state the conclusion explicitly. But the conclusion of the argument is, all that the Father gives to me I will in no wise cast out. This is the basis of the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. All that come to me I will in no wise cast out. Therefore, he could have said, but he presumed some understanding among his hearers, therefore all that the Father gives to me I will in no wise cast out. It follows necessarily inexorably, and it teaches the doctrine known as the perseverance of the saints. The Father elects, the elect come to Christ, and those who come to Christ will never be cast out. Now the doctrine is also taught explicitly in other parts of Scripture. I don't mean to be understood as saying this is the only verse of Scripture in which these doctrines are taught. By no means. The doctrines are taught in scores of verses. But here's a good example of a Sorites, in which the premise of the first argument, I mean, I'm sorry, the conclusion of the first argument becomes the premise for a second. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. All that come to me I will in no wise cast out. A syllogism. That's another term we need to talk about. We've had two up on the overhead. A syllogism. What is a syllogism? Those are two syllogisms. A syllogism is a form of argument in which there are two premises and three terms. Two premises and three terms. In the first one, the premises are if all men are mortal and if Socrates is a man. Those are the premises. Two premises. The terms are men, mortal, and Socrates. Two premises, three terms. It's perhaps the most common form of argument. It is certainly indispensable. Clark makes the point that it's indispensable not only in logic class, but in theology, or in chemistry, or physics. Uh, syllogistic reasoning uh, is fundamental and essential and indispensable. Now, there are two types of argument in logic. Deduction and induction. Deduction and induction, and we need to distinguish between those two. These are examples of deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning. These are examples of deduction. In deduction, in particularly in the first one there, it's very clear in the first one. Let me cover up the second one, so you're not focusing on that one for the time being. In deduction, as a general rule, you're arguing from the general to the particular. Arguing from the general to the particular. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Let's assume, though, you want to determine the color of geese. And you go out in your backyard, and you observe three geese out there, and they're all white. Uh, can you reach the conclusion that all geese are white? Does that follow necessarily? No, you're arguing there from the particular or the specific to the general. That's an instance of induction. Not deduction, it's an instance of induction. Suppose you want to expand your research. And you look in your neighborhood or your state at all the geese you can find, and they're all white. You haven't found any Canada geese yet. Let's assume they're all white. Can you reach the conclusion that all geese are white? How many geese would you have to observe to reach that conclusion? All of them. Is that possible? Is that possible for you to observe all geese? Let's assume you could at 
any given time observe all the geese in the world. What geese have you missed? The ones that have already died and the ones yet to be hatched. It's impossible to reach that general conclusion based on an inductive argument because you can never observe all geese. Induction is always fallacious. An inductive argument is always fallacious. When we talk about science later in the week, we'll spend more time on some of the logical fallacies involved in the scientific method. And this is one of the fundamental ones. It's impossible to observe all geese. If you want to make a statement about other things, if you want to be more scientific and make a statement about atoms, it's impossible to observe all atoms. Uh, and any conclusion that you make which embodies the conclusion all atoms or this is the way atoms behave or anything of that sort uh, is not a necessary consequence of the premises so you have committed a logical fallacy. Deductive reasoning can be either valid or invalid depend on how, depending on how it's done. But deduction allows, is the only form of reasoning that allows the possibility of having a necessary inference. Uh, one final definition, and that's uh, the word, and perhaps you've already heard it. Um, it's a $10 word that you probably need to know, epistemology, E-P-I-S, T-E-M-O-L-O-G-Y, epistemology. There are four major branch, branches of philosophy, and this is the most fundamental. It's the first branch. The second branch, just for your curiosity, is metaphysics. The third is ethics, and the fourth is politics. Everything else is minor compared to those four. If you're going to talk about economics or aesthetics, those are relatively minor studies compared to those four. This is the first major branch of philosophy, epistemology. It has to do with how we know. How do we know truth? How do we learn truth? By what method? Obviously, if a person comes up to you and says, uh, the moon is made of green cheese, and, and by the way, green cheese isn't green, so don't think the person's off his rocker. Green cheese simply means unripe cheese, and it's about the color of the moon. Uh, you ask him, how do you know that? Or if he comes up to you and says, everything we see is made of atoms. How do you know? And all atoms are made of smaller particles. How do you know? Uh, that's the most fundamental question in philosophy, uh, and it's the most important question that Christian philosophers need to ask pagan philosophers, non-Christian philosophers, whenever they make an assertion. How do you know? How do you know this is the case? And the study of how you know is epistemology. We need to study all these things and learn all these definitions because arguments, as Plato once said, are like men. Some of them are great pretenders. And what appears to be a sound argument or a good reason for doing something may, upon examination, turn out to be not a sound argument or not good at all. So if we learn these terms to begin with and then use them in our thinking about logic, um, we will have a much better handle uh, on what we're talking about. The terms, I believe, are defined at the back of the textbook. If you look at the back, uh, you will see a glossary in which most, if not all, of the terms we're using are defined. And you can check off the ones that we've gone over today, 
or add to that list. I may have included some things that aren't in the list uh, about those terms so that when I use them later in the week or that when someone else uses them, uh, you know what the terms mean. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. No, um, it's not. Um, it's an instance of revelation uh, whereby the words that Paul wrote were given to him by the Holy Spirit. But he's not making an induction. He's not arguing from uh, particular to a general conclusion. Um, and he's not even drawing an analogy at that point. What he has written is given by the inspiration of God. And it's not a form of induction. We'll get into this more. That's a good question. When we talk about Paul's use of logic. Uh, tomorrow night, I guess it is. Or maybe it's Wednesday night. Yes, sir. Good question. Good question. Uh, we have assumed in the argument that you cannot complete the induction. You cannot observe all the geese. Let's suppose you have a small number of things like the chairs in this room and that you can observe all those things. We call that in logic a complete induction. And then you can make a statement such as all the chairs in this room are white. X is a chair in the room, therefore X is white. A complete induction is the same as a deduction, but it's impossible, usually impossible to complete an induction. Yes, sir? That's true. So just because something is a logical fallacy does not mean it is not true. Well, well. In the sense that the plan is Let's, let's back up a little bit here. Uh, truth is a characteristic of propositions, and validity and invalidity are characteristics of arguments. Uh, people misuse the terms all the time. They'll talk about a statement being valid. Well, a statement is not valid. A statement is true or false. An argument is valid or invalid, but not a statement. We have to use the terms... Uh, strictly in our study. So we shouldn't confuse uh, fallacies and falsehoods. Two false premises, as we'll learn later on, can imply a true conclusion. Two false premises can imply a true conclusion. And we'll learn about that when we study the syllogism. Yes, sir. Well, if by inductive Bible study you mean you get out your concordance, and you look up every instance of the word justification and then draw your conclusion based on that, that's fine. In the inductive Bible study in that method, you have a complete induction because you have a finite number of sentences. And a complete induction then becomes a deduction. You can say justification means without exception declare or pronounce innocent in the Bible. And then you can draw inferences from that, um, if that's what you mean by inductive Bible study. Uh, but if you think that uh, uh, you're going to draw general conclusions from an induction that cannot be completed, uh, then you're going to be making mistakes all the time. Sure, if it, sure, if you want to find out what the Bible has to say about justification or about faith. Or, or whatever topic, and you don't know Greek or Hebrew, get out the concordance and look up every instance and uh, draw your conclusions on the basis of that. 
But that's possible only because the Bible has a finite number of sentences in it. If the Bible went on forever, you couldn't do it. It'd be like uh, the problem with geese, determining the color of geese. Any other questions about induction or deduction or any of these terms? One word about your homework. Um, in your homework sheet or syllabus or whatever it is, I have asked you to do for tomorrow in the workbook, that is the green book, pages 1 through 4. If you would do instead pages 1 through 6, I think it would be helpful. 1 through 6 rather than 1 through 4, yes. Go right ahead. We will have, uh, if there are some who don't have the books yet, they'll be here tomorrow. They'll be here tomorrow. Um, so, but feel free to copy the pages. There's no problem there. And then, of course, the test at the back of the workbook on page 101, if you would do that as well. And I'm not going to make you hand this in, but we are going to go over it in class so that everybody understands uh, very clearly uh, what is being said in this first chapter uh, of the book on logic. Any other questions at all? Yes, sir. I just have a question after the chapter of the meeting. And maybe the initial discussion was a little bit earlier there. And this, I suppose, if I had memorized the scripture, I had memorized a number of passages of the scripture out of the Bible, and suddenly I realized that when you see a particular part of scripture, a, 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 there's a principle that I didn't know before. Isn't that reason that principle from the doctor's Um uh, could you give me an illustration? All right. Uh, suppose that I I memorized a number of scriptures to deal with um feeding diligence. And I've also memorized a lot of scriptures to deal with um with uh not 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 well, you've certainly drawn an inference, but I would argue that it's not a, uh, if it's going to be a valid inference, it's not an inductive inference. You have combined two premises that perhaps you hadn't thought of together before and reached a conclusion which may not appear anywhere in the Bible, uh, but which is implied by the statements in the Bible. And uh, you've done that on the basis of a valid deduction. Mm -hmm.